Welcome to the Blackhawks Talk Podcast. I am Charlie Romeliotis, joined by James Naveau. James, they brought us back, the two of us, again, together again. How you doing? Pat Boyle steadfastly refusing to appear on air with us. We'll see how long his strike lasts. <laughs> you know what? He's currently um, he's currently playing some golf. He's doing uh, he's doing something at the Glen Club. I think there's like a tournament there or something, and he's participating in it. So I'm um, I'm looking forward to hearing from Pat to see how he did. And um, I've played with Pat a few times, and uh, I, I I hope he's doing I hope he's doing well on the golf course today because. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah, it's just it's me and you again, uh, James. We got some stuff to talk about. We're gonna hit on uh, some takeaways from the Mike Donny interview that that Pat and I did on Tuesday. Um, Kyle Davidson made some front office promotions. We'll touch on that. We'll also talk about the controversial Game Four overtime goal in Tampa Bay. Was it too many men on the ice penalty? We'll we'll break that down, and then we'll finish up with some NHL awards um, results discussion. I can finally reveal my ballot. Um, I don't have to be so secretive when we talk about it anymore. So, um, James, let's start out with the the Mike Donahue interview from Tuesday. So, first of all, my biggest takeaway is that he revealed on the podcast that um, he is the permanent amateur uh, scout. He is the new chief scout for the Blackhawks. He is not the interim um, because when, when Kyle Davidson was named the general manager on March 1st, he got Mike Donahue got the interim tag, but it was... I think Mike said the third week of March is when he had that interim tag lifted. So he is the permanent guy. The Blackhawks are not doing a search. He's going to be running his the draft um, July 7th and 8th. James, I'll throw it over to you. Anything stand out to you in that interview on what Mike said and maybe his approach going into the draft? I, I did kind of like the fact that you guys uh, broke that news. That was really well done. That was intrepid reporting by both of you. I thought I, just, I read the transcript after you guys were done, and that stood out to me just being hilarious. Like, no, I'm not the interim guy. I'm the full time guy. And you guys both just be like, well, congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> it was also funny too because it wasn't like, oh yeah, he he pulled it uh, a few weeks ago. It was like, oh, he pulled it in the middle of March. So I was like, oh, for. Three months ago, I'm glad we. Like, I'm glad. Where's your Where's your press release for that, man? Like yeah. that's what I would have asked him. I'd have been like, "What is Kyle like ashamed of this? Why didn't you get like your own press release and red carpet and <laughs> stuff, man? What's going on here?" Um, yeah. Aside from you guys breaking the news about that, of course, <laughs> I thought that the the two things that I really took away from it, it, one of them is something we've been talking about fairly extensively, is the. Alex DeBrinkett rumors have kind of ginned up and there's a lot of talk that he could potentially be moved this off season. And I had a, I isolated a quote from him about this where he said, I think the directive you want to build down the middle and on defense and in goal, your centers and your top three defensemen and your goalie are probably your most important positions. I have been on record as saying that I would be comfortable if the Blackhawks wanted to give Alex to bring a long-term extension. There are not a lot of guys in the NHL that you basically can plug into your lineup and assume they're going to score between 40 and 50 goals. And it feels like Alex to bring is becoming one of those guys. And I think that you can kind of make an exception to the build around the middle mentality. If you have a guy that's like that. Right. And I think that Alex to bring fits that bill. On the other hand, the way he says that the way you say you want to build down the middle, it's like, well, that's not going to happen if you're signing Alex to to a nine or a $10 million contract, giving Patrick Kane, you know, Joe Pavelski money, that six or seven or 8 million a season. That's not in sync with that kind of mentality. And I'm not sure if he just means organizationally that that's how they're going to do it, or if that's the way they're going to build their actual NHL roster. But that statement to me really stood out, especially with all the rumors that have been floating around about Alex to and really called into question the idea of whether or not the Blackhawks would seriously entertain giving him a contract extension at this point. Yeah, for sure. Um, and even in that quote too, I think something that jumped out at me is, uh, drafting best available player uh, over maybe an organizational need, right? We've seen in the past, like, I, I think, I feel like the last two drafts specifically, the the Blackhawks going with a uh, big, heavy defenseman, right? Like it was like a specific focus. And, and in years prior, it was going to draft the undersized defenseman, right? That the Adam Boquist, Henry Yokihar, you guys that can move the puck. And so it definitely felt like a concerted effort 
over the last several drafts to, to target specific needs in the organization. And, and I like the philosophy that he has about, um, you know, cautioning. You don't want, here's his direct quote. You don't want to leave that type of player. And he's talking about an organizational defenseman. If there's a, if there's an elite defenseman available for the Blackhawks, he goes, you don't want to leave that type of player there just because the seventh center on your list is available and you're hell bent on centers. So you have to be open to what might fall to you and be ready for it. So I really like that approach. I've always said in the past, um, you got to go for the best available player over specific needs. Right. And I always point to um, the 2000, I think it was the 2015, 16 draft. I can't remember when, when the Boston Bruins had three consecutive first round picks, it was like 14, 15 and 16. And it was basically like no name, no name. And then Jake DeBrusque is like the highest profile name in that list. And right after that three consecutive Bruins pick went Matt Barzell to the New York Islanders. And yep. I, I wonder if Boston didn't take Matt Barzell because they had Patrice Bergeron, and David Krejci at the time, right? Like they had their one and two centers for the next five years, basically solidified. So you don't want to ca like you want to caution away from just saying like, ah, well, we don't need a center. We'll go for, you know, this, like if that center is the best available player, even though you have a surplus of centers, you know, in Chicago's case, they, they could probably use some, some more centers in, in the organization. Um, I think they should go for it, but yeah, I, I definitely, it's funny that we picked out, um, like the same, we had the same takeaway from the same quote, but you had a different, different takeaway. And I had, I had, I also had a different takeaway. And then the one thing that also jumped out at me was like, we opened the podcast with it and he was like, like, is, is speed the mantra going forward? And he said, absolutely. We want to play as fast as we can, as quick as we can, like all the things that like you're watching the Colorado avalanche right now in the Stanley cup final, it feels like the Blackhawks are, are trying to get to that level. Now it's easy to play that way when you have Nathan McKinnon and Kale McCarr and guys that can really like the fastest players in the national hockey league. But I think that's the kind of game the Blackhawks want to play. Well, they can beat you with their speed, but you know, they can also maybe shut you down. Um, so I think, you know, th those are two of my biggest takeaways, um, James, when we talk about, you know, the first part and then the second part of just playing with speed and finding those up, those up tempo type players, whether it's through the draft free agency, that feels like um, that's the way they want to play moving forward. I did want to also point out, you had mentioned the best available player kind of mentality, and it's really easy for teams to say that and then to go into the draft and look to address uh, specific needs. And he even mentioned in the interview that the Blackhawks have tended to kind of go defense heavy in the last few drafts just to kind of build up the blue line stockpile in the farm system. And I think that the temptation is going to be there this year to potentially course correct for that and go mostly forwards maybe throw in a goaltender but I think that it's really critical to keep that best player available mentality in mind considering how many picks the Blackhawks have in the second and third rounds I think that they really need to focus on guys that they feel like have dropped below the valuation that they have for them and just to go ahead and get them no matter what position they end up playing. He listed off so many guys that have gotten taken in second and third rounds and made fairly quick impacts at the NHL level in recent years. And I think that mentality is one the Blackhawks really, they've done a good job of embracing in the past and they really need to continue to do so and not to worry about, you know, what position that player happens to play. If you find a guy that you have a first round valuation on, he drops into the second round. I think they absolutely need to go after him. And I'm confident after listening to that interview that that's what the Blackhawks are going to do. Yeah, definitely. And I know the, the Blackhawks don't have a first round pick currently, um, but he is preparing like he. They like dropped, he, he dropped a lot of hints that they may try to package picks and move up like that was kind of prevalent the entire interview, wasn't it? I, I felt like because they have a lot of second and third rounders, there's a possibility of packaging, you know, maybe they see a guy in the early second round that they can package a second rounder and maybe, a, you know, whatever, a later round pick to move up a few spots. I feel like that's what he might have been implying. I feel like if they are going to like, he, he made it known. I'm going to pull this up again really quick. Like we asked him about, um, they obviously don't have a first round pick right now. Um, but he's preparing as if, as if he does have one. Right. So he, he goes, I just spent time at the world championships, watching three players that are going to be gone in the top 10. 
And he goes, I wouldn't like my first draft to, for, for Kyle to dr- trade into the top 10 and, and says, who do you like? And he hasn't watched any of them, right? So <laughs> it, it's not just like the later round first rounders that he might be looking at. Like they are looking from one to, to 224 um, is what he said. And, and I think, you know, not having a first round pick, let's just say hypothetically it stays that way. I think he's taking a lot of pride in trying to find those hidden gems in rounds two and three, right? Like they have five draft picks currently in rounds two and three, and we're seeing some NHL superstars, Braden Point, Adam Fox. Those are the guys, and there's so many guys from like the, the Stanley Cup winning Blackhawks teams like Nicholas Jalmerson and Dustin Bufflin and Dave Bolin and Duncan Keat. Like all those guys were later round draft picks. Brandon Side and Andrew Shaw too. Yeah, and Alex Debrinkit too, second round pick. You know, so there are so many... There's so many of those players available, like like Mike said, and it's just really trying to find them. Um, and it's taking a lot of pride in in, in finding uh, those types of players. Let's. Um, you have one more thing? No, that's it, man. I want to transition to other front office stuff. I'm just so amped up about this. You see, I've got a giant uh, coffee with me today. Let's go. I love it. Yeah, they, the Kyle Davidson did round out. Man, he's been he's been busy, man. Like he he. He gets the, like, he goes from interim general manager to, like, interviewing for the permanent general manager gig. And, like, as soon as he gets the permanent general manager gig, like, days later, he's making these changes where it's, like, Mark Kelly is out. And, and like, there's just so many uh, different moving parts. So, he he adds to his team. He brings back Norm McIver. And then a few weeks later or a month later, he brings Jeff Greenberg into the mix. And now he's kind of rounding out. He Well, he finally rounded out his... Um, hockey operations leadership group by uh, with Mark Eaton, who will remain as the assistant general manager of player development. Megan Hunter has been promoted to assistant general manager of hockey operations. So now the Blackhawks are going to have two assistant general managers. And then Brian Campbell will remain in the hockey operations as an, as an advisor who is basically Kyle Davidson, right? Kyle Davidson's right hand man um, when he had the interim tag. And then Carolyn Pilch has been promoted to director of player personnel. So it, it is, it's a unique structure, right, James? You got the general manager um, who's 34 years old, and then he's got two associate general managers, yep. one a veteran in Norm McIver, one has a baseball background in Jeff Greenberg, and then now he's got two assistant general managers, Mark Eaton, who's focusing on player development and, and things of that nature, and then Megan Hunter, um, you know, who, who's overseeing, um, uh, let's see, I'm having a brain fart here as I try to find the, oh yeah, overseeing budgeting, team services, contract execution, team security, and player services. So it, it's like, it's a unique structure where there are multiple different layers to this front office. What are your thoughts just on on the promotions and Kyle Davidson just rounding out his his um, his leadership staff? He's certainly trying to come up with a lot of different ways to uh, like include a lot of different voices in the room, right? I think that we we kind of looked at him being, you know, 34 years old and kind of evaluating whether or not he was going to need like a really good veteran associate GM. He obviously has that in the form of Norm McIver. He got, you know, way, way outside the box when he hired uh, Greenberg to also be an associate. So we kind of already knew that he was willing to have a lot of different voices in the room. And I think that some of these hires really indicate that he's taking that perhaps to a greater level than we even anticipated. I feel like having Megan Hunter in the front office working in hockey ops is going to be really interesting. She's worked in as an amateur scout. She's worked in hockey administration and seen a lot of different you know, points of view in the organization. And I think it's going to be really interesting to have her, you know, kind of be in charge of, you know, budgeting and all of those different things. It's going to be really critical for, you know, influencing free agents to come here to have a really good lid on all of those things. And so I think that it's going to be fascinating to have her with all of those different viewpoints. I I think having Mark Eaton still oversee the Rockford Ice Hogs and the amateur and pro player development is a really smart move by the Blackhawks. I think that he has been in the organization long enough and has done enough different things that I can really see him thriving in that role. Those obviously were the two kind of main takeaways that I had from the list of hires. I'm also really intrigued to see how much of a role Brian Campbell is going to have in the front office. I mean, they were leaning on him when they were hiring the GM in the first place. So it's fascinating to see that he's still going to be part of the leadership team and part of the mix moving forward. And, you know, we're going to get a really quick look at how this front office structure is going to work when we move through 
finally hiring a head coach going into the NHL draft in a couple of weeks and then into free agency. I just think that some of those names are really kind of jumping off the page at me. And yeah, just the size of the brain trust that Kyle Davidson has assembled is really really interesting to me. I, I know that it, it'd be really easy to try to kind of boil it down to these few people have say, and then we're going to go, but having that many different voices on a project that's going to be as big as this rebuild potentially is going to be is definitely um, an intriguing strategy and one that I think could really work out well for them. Yeah. And it's a lot of people internally that are getting promotions, right? So it's, it's gotta be encouraging within the organization. Um, where you know if you get a job with the Blackhawks, maybe at a lower level, like you can quickly work your way up. We saw Kyle Davidson do it as an intern to now the general manager. Um, Megan Hunter, I don't even know if she started in the hockey operations. Like I think she might have even been in in some of the, the business aspects, right? And then ended up moving over to become a scout and was the director of administration. And now she's assistant general manager. And she has such a decorated background too. Collegiate career, being one of the top female hockey players uh, when, when she was in college. So it, it's a very well diverse group that Chicago has put together. And, you know, like you mentioned too, like Brian Campbell, I think that I think him being in an advisor role, advisory role, like that's a, that's a perfect fit for him. Like I remember when, when Kyle Davidson got named the permanent general manager on March 1st um, and there was like discussion or there were like early reports that was like Brian Campbell could, could be, um, you know, a potential assistant general manager, Kyle Davidson's right hand man. And I thought, I'm like, man, that is, that was really risky. Cause like Brian Campbell doesn't really have that kind of background to like typically assistant general managers. They're working on contract negotiations and they're work like, that's like, that's nuts and bolts kind of stuff. Like Brian Campbell, I feel like this is a perfect role for him. Kind of be the advisor to Kyle Davidson, be, you know, be in his ear about maybe stylistically ways they want to play potential players, like stuff like that. Well, so yeah, I, just look at the way he played like that's. Yeah exactly what the Blackhawks are going for is that kind of uh, offensive, speedy kind of blue line. I think that he fits that, you know, paradigm kind of perfectly, doesn't he? Yeah, no question. And so I, I really feel like this is like, this is the perfect kind of fit for him. So you basically, so you have all these, you know, different, different components to the, to the leadership structure. And I, I feel like, you know, it could benefit the Blackhawks having a lot of these different, you know, diverse backgrounds, Jeff Greenberg and Megan Hunter and all these different perspectives. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how it all comes together, but it's nice. I'm sure Kyle Davidson feels a little bit of a sense of relief that he finally has his staff together. Right. And, yep. and it's, he does doing it a few weeks before the NHL draft and free agency when, when things are really going to pick up. So I'm sure it's, it's one major thing he doesn't have to worry about um, anymore. Uh, all right, James, let's get on. We got to talk about game four um, last night. We're recording this on Thursday. Obviously, Tampa, Colorado, th this this felt like win winner of that game wins the series, right? Like if Colorado wins, they go up 3-1, and it's like I don't know if Tampa can beat Colorado three in a row, especially two in Colorado. And then you felt like if Tampa would have evened it up at 2-2, you know, then the momentum is going the other way, and and – Maybe there's a goalie controversy in Colorado and Vasilevsky's heating up and it feels like Tampa gets better as the series goes on, but that didn't happen. And it was a very controversial um, game winning goal in overtime by Nazem Kadri. And we have to, we have to kind of break it down in real time. There were so many different layers that it was like, first of all, no one knew that the puck went in the net, not even Nazem Kadri, right? Yeah. Like it was, I see like a lot of comparisons to the Patrick Kane goal in 2010 and it, no question it fell right in there because no one knew it went in. But like Patrick Kane knew that it went in in Philly. Like Nazem Kadri didn't even know that it went in. I think it was Bowen Byram that was the only guy that really saw the puck go in the net. And he like skated from the neutral zone to the, below the goal line and like was pointing at the puck, like right in front of the, the referee pointing at it, that it got stuck in the upper part of the net. Yeah, Wes um, McCauley was just kind of staring in the general direction and didn't seem to see the puck. Yeah, so so that was that was bizarre in and of itself. But then John Cooper steps up to the podium and he takes one question and he says, um, I'll be available tomorrow and something along the lines of you guys will see it, but we should still be playing right now. And everyone's like, wait, what? So now you're, we're like, we're all replaying. Like I went back and I looked, I was like, what, what could he be talking about? Like a potential offside? Like was one of the guys late? Was it a delayed offside and Kadri entered the zone prematurely or, you know, was it too many men? And so then you look and it's like, oh, wow. Like this is, 
very clearly too many men on the ice penalty that went miscalled. James, I want to throw it over to you. What were your thoughts on on it? Because I I have I have I have a couple thoughts, but I want to hear I want to hear your take on it first. Like, what did you see? Like, should it have been called? And and like this stuff happens all the time. Sure. But I I will clarify why I don't think this specific situation um is not a it might be a common occurrence, but it this it, it should have been called, and I'll explain why. But I want to throw it over to you first. I I think my biggest takeaway is that you. I real I would really like to know why it's not specifically reviewable because it's not too many men is not a reviewable play, is it? No. And, and I and believe I, in overtime, I believe in overtime, uh, I don't think there are challenges, right? I, I I think it's every review is is initiated by the NHL, right? Like yeah. any anytime there's a goal or, or anytime there's something close, they they review it. I, I believe that's that's the case. So it seems odd to me that if you can challenge an offside or really encourage the officials to look at an offside, I really want to know why you can't look at a too many men penalty and do the same thing. I think that that really that obviously can impact the outcome of games as we saw last night. I, I just, I get the sense that that's something that the league should be able to review. I feel like them, whether or not they called it is, you know, going to be up for endless debates here. And I think that you can make an argument either way that, you know, oh, how much of an impact did it have directly on the play? Um, you know, should they have called it? Got it. I just think that it should be reviewable. And I think that if John Cooper sees that on the monitor, that he should be able to call the official over and go, Hey, you need to look at that on video and you need to rule that there were six guys on the ice for you know, six skaters on the ice for Colorado. I think that that's something that the league needs to address. And it seems kind of odd to me that if you can have all of these like weird iterations of rules around whether or not a play is on side and you can review those, you need to be able to review whether or not a play had too many men on the ice. Yeah, I I think it's probably not reviewable because it's 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 subjective, right? Like there's no there's nothing in the rule book that says, you know, um, the five foot rule is like the only real you know thing that's in the rule book about too many men is if a guy's within five feet of the bench, they generally will give them a little bit of leeway unless they're playing the puck. But I think that. Right. I would think that if that's going to be the case and you're going to have that rule, that seems to me something you can pretty easily see on video. Then if he's more than five feet from the bench, then bam, it should be a penalty upon review. Right. Here's my biggest issue with it and why it should, it was bl a blatantly missed call. When we see this in games in the past, like guys, let's say Patrick Kane is leaving the ice and Alex DeBrinket is hopping on for Kane. Like Alex DeBrinket, sometimes he like if if you're Alex DeBrinket, you, you can hop over the boards and you can notice if the play is coming towards you, you intentionally do not play the puck until Patrick Kane is on the ice, right? Right. So we we've seen situations like that, um, or if a guy jumps onto the ice and it's it's total like the play. Let's just say the plays in the offensive zone or the defensive zone where it's totally away from the bench. We've seen guys jump on early, right, and try to enter the zone. That that feels like fine. They're gonna let it slide. Th this goal specifically, though, Nazem Kadri came on for Nathan McKinnon. Like yeah. that's a center for center exchange, and and McKinnon is the last one off the ice, and Nazem Kadri is the last one off the bench. So like, when Kadri comes off the bench. By the time the camera is panning on him, like Kadri like has the puck and McKinnon is still not on the bench yet. So like Kadri would have jumped on the ice when Nathan McKinnon was probably still closer to the goal right. than the bench, right? So that's my that's a blatant offside. Like or like or that's a blatant too many men on the ice penalty. Yeah. Um so that's where that's where it's so it's so different. Where like it, it's not like the it's not like the play was like away from it and Nazem Kadri jumped early. Like that is a Nathan Nazem Kadri jumping on from Nathan McKinnon. And that is his guy. That is a too many money in the ice penalty. And James, we also need to dispel this. Like we've seen, um, we've seen, I, I mean, I, I saw out there that Tampa, they're like Tampa had seven guys on the ice that is happening so far away from the play. And it, it doesn't, it's not an offside on, or it's not a too many men on the ice penalty for, for those Tampa Bay uh, 
players because it's happening away from the play. And they're, they're like that exchange is happening. It's like on the, like the five foot rule, like you said, it would have been too many money on the ice for Tampa Bay. If those guys were playing the puck. Right. But the fact that Kadri played the puck, like, and Nathan McKinnon was coming off the ice, like that was his guy, man, that's a, that's a tough miss call. But, but then at the other, at, on, on the flip side, uh, James, I saw that last Eastern conference final Tampa Bay, this went their way where the New York Islanders had seven guys on the ice. And I believe it was game seven uh, in an uh, Yanni Gord and they won one to nothing in game seven. And, and like, that was the game winning goal. Right. So, Hey, sometimes you get the break. Sometimes you don't, but it was just unfortunate that it happened um, in overtime. Oh, yeah, I, like I think what, what I don't understand is also the people who are saying that, you know, oh, well, you know, the, if you're going to bring up stuff from like, you know, 2019 or whatever to like justify what potential too many men penalty here, like just you can miss me with all of that, man. Like, <laughs> let's just focus on the issue at hand. I feel like the the fact that it's not subject to video review, I do feel is strange like if you can review all these other things why you can't review that is kind of beyond me and i know that there you know there's elements of judgment called to it as well and that's what the nhl said in their kind of defense of the way that the officials kind of handled it last night but there's also some kind of black and white elements to that rule too and i think that as you pointed out correctly with nathan mckinnon being so far from the bench when nazim kadri jumped on the ice i feel like if that had been reviewable they would have ended up assessing the penalty and the game would have gone on we also we also need to of course bring up the elephant in the room which is that colorado was bludgeoning tampa to death in that entire overtime period like it was only a matter of time until they scored. They clearly had the legs and Tampa did not. So, I mean, John Cooper can say all he wants. Oh, we'd still be playing. Nah, you probably wouldn't be. But, you know, <laughs> what? A, it's fine. Like they, I have to give Tampa credit. They very clearly throughout the series have been the team that's had more miles on their legs and they've been a step slower than Colorado has been, but they've really held it together really well. Winning game three the way they did was really impressive. They could have won last night if a few bounces had potentially gone their way, and we could be looking at a completely different series right now. So while I do have to say to John Cooper, eh, he would have ended sooner rather than later, and most likely in Colorado's favor, regardless of the outcome of that play, I do think that, you know, you do have to give Tampa credit for the way they've continued to fight in this series. Yeah, for sure. I, I do think Colorado has been the better team for, for four games. So like them going back home up three to one, it doesn't feel like it feels like that's probably how it should be. Right. Like Colorado has been the better team, although you you can argue. I mean, Tampa Bay, they were really good in the first period of, of game four. I think they were out shooting them like 17 to four at one point. Yeah. So like Tampa, Tampa Bay definitely had their. um Definitely had their chances to, to really make this a series. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it to you. Does this get done in fr on Friday? Do you, you think Colorado closes it out? I, I I think so, right? I I think so, and that's not a knock on Tampa Bay. I think that they have shown once again that their adjustments are just incredible. The way that they're able to roll with the punches in a series, and no matter how bad things look, I mean, they looked completely decimated after game two and Steven Stamkos was, you know, furious about the way they had played. John Cooper wasn't thrilled about it. Then they turned around in game three and they came out and they won on home ice. I mean, that's just the kind of team that they are. It would not shock me at all if they won game five and forced this to go back to Tampa, but I'm still going to say that Colorado's finishing it off in game five. I just think that they're the more well-rested team. Their speed is really giving Tampa a lot of issues because of kind of the exhaustion we're seeing on the, the on behalf of the champs there. And it just looks like a matter of time before we're going to see a champ coronated because the, the abs just look like such an incredible team. Yeah. And, and Tampa, the reason why I feel like Colorado is going to get it done on Friday is because Tampa is so decimated right now. Like, not having like Braden Point gave it a go in the first two games, and he's just very clearly not healthy, right? And then Eric Chernak gets hurt last game. Nicholas Paul got hurt in, in the early part of the series, and and then I think Brandon Hagel might have gotten hurt in in overtime. So it's like Tampa is just they're, they're dropping like flies quickly, and Colorado is seemingly I know they lost Andre Burakovsky, but then you get Nazem Kadri back, and it's like that's I mean, that that's so. That's so lethal for them down the middle. And Nathan McKinnon hasn't even been playing to like the standard that we're known from him. Right. So it's not like 
Colorado is winning based on their superstar power. They're just, you know, they're, they're, they're just winning based on their depth and their speed. All right, last one, James, last topic. I wanted to get to the uh, the NHL awards because I can officially, we can officially talk about it without me being secretive of who I might have picked for my ballot. So um, I think the two, the, the two um, trophies or the, the awards that we are really kind of focused on was who's going to win the Norse? Was it going to be Roman Yossi or Kale McCarr? And then, I don't know. I don't necessarily know if it was going to be who is who is going to win the heart because I think we had a pretty good idea of Austin Matthews, but I feel like seeing the the actual voting, the results of like one to twelve, like who, how did how did that shape out? So let's start with the Norris Trophy really quick. Are you surprised Kale McCarr won over Roman Yossi? Now I will say, so I had Kale McCarr one. I had Roman Yossi two on my ballot. Kale McCarr won the actual Norris Trophy, but Roman Yossi had more first place votes. It was ninety eight sure to ninety two. So that was interesting. The fact that Roman Yossi garnered more first place votes than Kale McCarr, but McCarr still won by like the slimmest of margins. Any surprise in, in that? I'm not surprised that it was as close as it was. I'm not surprised that Kale McCarr ended up narrowly edging Yossi out. What I am surprised about, I'm not the world's greatest mathematician, but I take great umbrage with the fact that a voter did not have Roman Yossi on their ballot at all. Okay, what, wait, wait, wait. What you know, sport are you watching that is not in your top five? Time out. Time out, James. Do you know who it was? Who was it? It was a it was a it was a Chicago writer. Who was it? It was Scotty Powers. Why? Scotty yes. Powers, why have you let me down? <laughs> Man. I listen, I love Scotty. Um I, I'm I'm not gonna say anything bad about him because we I, I adore Scott Powers for the record. Yeah. I, I I've said that I've podcasted about hockey and written about hockey for quite a while, and Scott Powers is quite possibly not only the best dude I know that does the hockey beat writer thing, but he's also brilliant. I still take great umbrage with the fact Roman Yossi wasn't on his ballot. What's going on here? Okay, wait, time out. It, it's it it gets I, I don't even have a that is a separate issue. But let's move on to the Hart Trophy because there was a writer that left both Austin Matthews and Connor McDavid off the ballot, off the Hart Trophy ballot. I, I don't know how that I don't know how that's possible. I think JT I, Miller was on the ballot, but not. I am gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say like you defend it in the public sphere. Why? How are they not two of the? How are they not in the top five players in the league this year? Seriously, I want to yeah. I want to hear a defense that Austin Matthews was not one of the top five players in the league this year. Yeah. And you know what? I feel like I've said this on the podcast and I was I was able to say this without giving away who I picked. But like one of my my biggest pet peeves about the NHL awards is that sometimes we can overthink like most valuable player versus like who the best like who the best players in the league were. Right. Like like the fact that Sidney Crosby only has two heart trophies and he's a top five player of all time. Like how much of that was he got docked because of, Oh, he played with Malkin like his career. So like Malkin, it, obviously Crosby can't win MVP because if you got Malkin on there, who's also like a top 10 player at the time, how could you give Crosby the MVP? Right. So like, uh, yeah. And we kind of got into that a little bit when we were discussing handicapping it for sure. I can, I can see that. Yeah. And it, it's like, again, like, I think that the example I used in the past was like Taylor Hall has a heart trophy. It's like, which is fine. Like he deserved the MVP that season. But like when he, when, when guys are getting inducted into the hall of fame and Connor McDavid is not a six time heart trophy winner or, or Crosby is a two time heart trophy winner. It, it feels a little weird that he doesn't have more. Right. It feels a weir little weird that like the best player of our generation, um, Sidney Crosby, like only has, you know, two heart trophies. Uh, so anyway, I digress. The, the one thing I did want to get into that was interesting um, is like Igor Shosturkin. So full disclosure, like I, I left him off my ballot entirely. Um, one to five with the, us, us voters, we get, we got to rank them one to five and I left him off my ballot completely. And it wasn't necessarily a, um, a knock on Igor Shosturkin as opposed to there were so many qualified candidates Leon Dreisaitl, Connor McDavid, Austin Matthews, Johnny Gaudreau, Kirill Kaprizov, like Kale McCarr, Roman Yost. There were so many candidates that like I had such a um I had such a high standard for a goaltender getting on my ballot that it was like you must have 
you had to have a like a historically good season to make my ballot uh, if you're a goaltender, right? And I had two things that that really knocked out Shosturkin to, like to below my five, and it was the fact that he only started 52 games. Like yeah. I, I'm, you know, you look at you look at previous goalies. So I was doing some research. Like the last 50 years, there have only been there have been three goalies to win the heart. Uh, it's Carey Price, Dominic Hasek twice, and Jose Theodore. Carey Price in 2015, he started 66 games. He was 44, 16, and six with a 1.9 goals against average, 933 save percentage, and nine shutouts. Like that's ridiculously good. Like they were leaning on him so heavily. And then Dominic Hasek, 1998. Get a load of this. He started 72 games and he had 13 shutouts. Right. And then, then the year, um, the year prior, he started 66 games, 930 save percentage, five shutouts. And then Jose Theodore won it in 2012. He started 67 games. So like all of those goaltenders were like critical parts of the team. And when I look at Igor Shosturkin, 52 starts, which is totally fine. He had a historically good season. It was like a 34 um, goal saved above expected, which was like historically good. But like Alexander Georgiev, when he was in that, the, the Rangers were 15, 10 and two. So like th there wasn't a significant drop off like in their record. So like, I don't know, poke holes in my argument, James. Like, was, is I, am I being too harsh on Shesterkin that I didn't leave, that I left him off the ballot? Because I saw some people had him won, and it's totally good. But, like, if he started 66 games like Carey Price did in 2015 and he put up the same numbers, like, that that would have been way more impressive because they were really riding and dying with him. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's like workload, too. Like, Shesterkin was, like, fresh, you know? So, like, I don't know. Like, what, what do you think? I... I, I think we've discussed uh, the idea of a goaltender winning the heart. And I think that your, your argument that it has to be like a historically good season is very well taken. It's very similar to a pitcher winning the most valuable player award in baseball, aside from Shohei Otani, of course, like he, <laughs> he's a, he's on a completely different plane of existence basically. So we're not going to, for the sake of this conversation, we'll leave him out. But I, I do I agree with you that a guy who barely played over 50 games should not be considered the league's best player. I think that he deserves the he he deserved to be in the conversation at least. I mean, there were a lot of guys who had incredible seasons. Jonathan Huberto, Johnny Gaudreau both had really good seasons. I, I think that Shisterkin finishing third was kind of surprising to me that he finished that far ahead and got 24 first place votes and Johnny Gaudreau only got three. That really surprised me. The, the fact Roman Yossi got more votes than Johnny Gaudreau did was also very surprising. I, I still, to me, when I look down the voting list, like I am astonished the only player on the Colorado Avalanche who got any Hart Trophy votes at all was Kale McCarr, and he only got one second place vote. He didn't get any first place votes at all. Kirill Kaprizov from Minnesota got two first place votes. Johnny Gaudreau got three. Roman Yossi got five. You're telling me those guys were more valuable and more, had more outstanding seasons this year than Kale McCarr did? That's hard for me to, you know, understand. But I'm, I, I'm actually, I'm really glad that you mentioned that too, because that's also part of the reason why I, I left Shesterkin off because of that logic. Like Nathan McKinnon is very clearly like one of the best players in the world, right? And he, he like, did so, not get a single top five vote for MVP. But do you know why? Because listen, 88 points in 65 games. So his his points per game average was 1.35. That was that was basically top six players in the league, but he only played 65 games. So like Igor Shosturkin, he he started 52 games, and I think he missed multiple weeks with an injury. So like if we're gonna dock Nathan McKinnon that he didn't play full 82, like yeah. Well, How I think are we he's gonna... also being docked that he plays for the Colorado Avalanche and they're stocked but, but with I, really good players. But I think I'm going to do this math on the fly right now. So like, I think if Nathan McKinnon, let's just say he played a full 82 game season. I'm doing this 80, 88 points divided by 65 multiplied 17. Math is always really entertaining. On a he podcast. would have finished with 111 points and it would have been fourth right above Leon Dreisaitl and right behind McDavid, Goudreau and Huberto. And I bet you Nathan McKinnon is on heart ballots like 
is on basically everyone's heart ballot if if he played a full 82 game season. So like that's another reason why I left off Shesterkin because like if we're gonna dock goalies for or if we're gonna dock skaters for that they didn't play a full season or they play, only played 70 games or so, like 52 starts is like <laughs> and and also too James. Um, so I was looking at the the 2015 Carey Price stats. So he had a this is a, according to Evolving Hockey. He had a 38.8 goal saved above expected. The next goalie was Andre Pavlik, 20. So like it was like a ridiculous drop off with Shesterkin. He had a 37.2. So like right there, right in the Carey Price range, yep. 14 fewer starts though. And the next, the next best goalie was Freddie Anderson at 28. So it was like a difference of nine. So like it. So so then if if Shesterkin's in the heart conversation, if he should be number one on ballots, why isn't Freddie Anderson closer to the heart, right? Like, I don't Freddie know. Freddie Anderson so, finished fourth in uh, Vesna voting, by the way. Did you have any issues with the uh, the way the Vesna shook out? Well, I feel I feel like um, I feel like Saros and Vasilevsky, they got they were finalists because they played more games like Saros started like 60 plus games. And, yeah. um, you know, and Freddie Anderson only started, what, 50? two like 52 games played so yeah. like right there was just 52 and also anderson did get a first place vote in the vesna as did vasilevsky as did sorokin you know who didn't yeah jacob markstrom didn't get a single first place vote yeah that that was interesting led the league in shutouts um so i will say full disclosure this was my heart ballot james austin matthews one Connor mcdavid two johnny gaudreau three leon dreisaitl four and I had Jonathan Hubert 05. And I actually think I had, why am I, why, how am I supposed to like be mad at that ballot? I think that's a really good ballot. I, I think, I think the, the one where you can kind of poke a hole through it is Leon dry at number four, but like, I'm sorry, this guy is a top four player in the world. Top three, probably. Yep. And I'm not leaving him off my ballot. You take away McDavid from Edmonton. They're a borderline playoff team. You take away dry from Edmonton and McDavid stays. They're still a borderline playoff team. Like they Leon dry um, it goes back to my like original argument. Like if this guy is going to be when it's all said and done, he might be like a top five player of like our generation, Crosby, McDavid, Matthews, McKinnon, um, dry sidle, like this those five players or will not stand. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ovechkin. Yeah. This coach, coach, I, I, maybe I'm being, but like, look at the postseason Leon dry I had too. And I know this doesn't, this is the, this award is regular season only. Well, like yeah, Leon well, that Dreisaitl, would probably explain why Shesterkin finished third. If it was postseason included too. Right. Yeah, no, it, th- we submit this, that the, the deadline is the day before or the day of playoffs. So the day Damn. the playoffs start. Yeah. So this is anyway, I, I just want to, I'm going to get off my soapbox now, but I, I feel really good about that ballot. And, and I, I know Shesterkin's not on there, but like I had, I feel like my reasons are not far fetched. Um, uh-huh. Like you have to have a historically good season and play a, a ton, like a ton of hockey, for you to to really get on that as a goalie. And he was the yeah, he, he won the Vezina, and he was like yeah. far and away the, the runaway winner. And he very clearly should have been. So like, you know, he, he went I home with a trophy. Some odd games. Yeah, exactly. So okay, I I can't I can't let the podcast end without saying why Scott Powers left Roman Yossi off of his Norris ballot because I said that I took great umbrage with the decision and I'm still going to say that I think Scott should have had him in his top five and leaving him off the ballot was just not correct but here's what he said to (laughs) he replied to Mitt Romney it looks like which is very odd I honestly real Mitt Romney no 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 the guy's (laughs) name is Mitt Romney I'm assuming that's like a hockey thing but anyway I honestly didn't think he was enough of a two-way defenseman to be considered for the award this season. His offense was special, but his defensive metrics were below average. The award shouldn't just be for the top offensive defenseman. I could see where I maybe should have put him fourth or fifth. So there you go. That is uh, Scott Powers' defense of why he he wrongly did not include Roman Yossi on his ballot for the Norris at all. Well, here, I I will say... Um, I don't mind. I don't mind that reasoning, right? The problem is that there's no award for defensive defenseman. Thank you, right? So, like, if there was an award, <laughs> if there was the Nicholas Jalmerson Award, who would have been a ten-time winner for the defensive defenseman award, um, if there was such thing, then there's there's a separation between like, all right, who's who's just the best defenseman? Like, who is the best defenseman in the league? Like. Kale McCarr is like not the 
I mean, he's a really underrated like defensive defenseman, but like he's not like the best shutdown defenseman in the National Hockey League. He's just a really good defenseman. Yeah. So I think that's where the discrepancy is. Like maybe there are just some voters, some writers that have different interpretations of the award, which is which is totally fair. And you also uh, can't understate the impact that Devon Taves has on Kale McCarr's defense either. Like who's right. Roman Yossi skating with in Nashville <laughs> nowadays? Like. Right, right. I, I, I'm not going to hold like him being below average. It's like, yeah, he plays for the friggin' Nashville Predators, bro. Like, come on. Yeah. And yeah. I know there are metrics for that. And I'm sure Scott would hit me over the head with the math and make me look <laughs> like a giant idiot. But just Scott, Scott, uh, Scott, <laughs> Scott, I feel like we're, I'm not, we're driving, dragging Scott in the mud here. And I'm not, Absolutely I'm not trying not. to. No, well, right. it's interesting. <laughs> Interestingly, though, he, he left uh, Trevor Zegers off his Calder ballot as well. So that, that was an also like, uh, an interesting decision um, by Scott. Trying to argue that Zegris should have won the Calder because of the highlight real goals he put up, or something like that, like the impact that he had, like from oh, a man. from a like the way the team looked perspective. It's like no, 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 no. Let's not start doing that, please. Yeah. Let's not let's not turn the Calder into a uh, an SB or something, man. Come on. Yeah, more. <laughs> listen, Tr- Trevor Zegris is going to probably win. Um, He'll win some awards throughout his career. I more cider was, was definitely the, the Calder. Um, a thousand percent agree. Yeah, with that. for sure. Scotty, I love you. He's not listening to this podcast, but no, he isn't. But I, I, I must again say that I love Scott Powers, and you can love somebody and still disagree with their logic and their voting. So, yeah, it's a, we have a we have a we have a good relationship. It, it's more of like a brotherly kind of like disagreement, right? You know, you have some disagreements, but then in the end, you guys still love each other. So, Absolutely, Scotty, much man. love. All right, James, that's going to do it for this edition of the Blackhawks Talk Podcast. Thanks for listening to my rants on the uh, the NHL awards. <laughs> this doofus not including Chesterkin on his heart trophy ballot. What I, a guy. <laughs> I, see, I will go to my grave with that. Um, the problem is I, I just – I don't get into Twitter arguments, right? Like I, I – I, It's not worth can't, it. It's not worth it. So, like, if you want to – if you disagree, totally fine, but I'm not going to get into, like, a Twitter spat. Like, I'll, I'd love to – have a conversation with uh, you, James, on the podcast about Should it. Should I start one with you? Should I start a Twitter feud with you over this? I, I won't reply. I won't reply. Fine. <laughs> I'll just bludgeon you. That it'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, James. Good stuff. We'll see you next week.